fantastic to see. Um, welcome everyone uh, joining today's webinar on hydrogen end use sectors. It's phenomenal to see uh, 1,500 of you have registered. Uh, so there is definitely still a lot of interest in, in hydrogen and webinars <laughs> this far into the pandemic. Uh, this is Luke from uh, Reuters events and I'm joined today by Mona Tijani from uh, Pillsbury, uh, Winthrop, uh, Shaw, Pittman, LLP, uh, Graham Cooling from ITM Power, Oliver Bishop from Shell, and O.T. Eravasti from uh, Neste. Uh, the panelists will introduce themselves further in a second. Today, we're really excited to explore uh, the end use sectors. There's clearly a lot of buzz around hydrogen and excitement around the latest projects and technologies, but like any market, it will have to start with the demand. Uh, as a heads up to so this webinar is being recorded so you can watch it back and share it with your colleagues in the industry. We really want to kickstart conversations uh, so do share it far and wide um, and you will have the recordings within a week. So let's delve into the session. Uh, Mo uh, Mona Dejani, please introduce yourself and let's kickstart things. Great, well uh, good morning to everyone in uh, the, the North America and good afternoon to uh, all our uh, European and good evening Asian uh, audience members. I am very delighted to uh, talk with some experts in our field in hydrogen. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy that you all joined us today. We have a list of, we're gonna have a lively discussion to talk about uh, the end users and the application of hydrogen with end users, with our uh, very esteemed uh, panelists here joining us. Just a little bit about me. Uh, I am, uh, as Luke said, Mona Dejani. I'm based in Manhattan and London in normal times. And uh, I have an uh, engineering background and I have an MBA and I'm a lawyer. And what I do is uh, I'm the leader of the um, energy and infrastructure practice for Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman. And that's a global law firm. And uh, what I do is work with all these guys and put the deals together for hydrogen. So uh, I'd like you all to meet our uh, panelists. I'm gonna start first with Oliver. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background and what you're doing and Shell, et cetera. Go Thank for you. it. Thank you, Mona. And I'll try and keep it short because obviously we only have 60 minutes and it's fantastic to see so many participants today. It's, it's really great. I'm very chuffed actually. Um, so my name is Oliver Bishop, General Manager for Hydrogen uh, at Shell. Uh, my responsibility is in uh, the mobility space. Um, maybe very briefly about, about Shell. I mean, Shell has a, a net zero uh, target by 2050. Um, and what, basically what that means is we want to be providing renewable power to uh, you know, homes and businesses, biofuels for things like aviation, and of course, hydrogen. Uh, which I'm going to talk about in a little, little more detail. Um, and of course, alongside that, we have to tackle all, all the emissions that uh, scope one and two, so what, what we produce, but also, really importantly, what our customers uh, produce. Um, so, you know, being more efficient and introducing things like nature-based solutions is, is super important. But back to hydrogen. So hydrogen in Shell is part of our growth pillar. Um, it is at the core of, you know, alongside those other couple of things I mentioned, uh, of how we're going to tackle the energy transition. And within that space, right now, even today, Shell has more than 50 hydrogen refueling stations focused in Europe. You can travel today across the length and breadth of Germany, but also in places like the UK, the Netherlands, and then also in the United States and California, and obviously also uh, Canada as well. And it's not just about refueling passenger cars, it's also about refueling trucks. And we're going to talk about heavy duty here because that's a very interesting sweet spot for hydrogen. And it's also about industry. We will talk a little bit about electrolyzers. So Shell's just completing construction of a 10 megawatt electrolyzer. And I'm sure Graham here will talk a little more about that. <laughs> and we have further ambitions to build a 200 megawatt electrolyzer. So another step up in ambition in Rotterdam. 
Um, and so you can see Shell becoming more and more active in all parts of the value chain. The production of hydrogen, blue or green, the distribution of hydrogen, and then it's marketing through various channels for transportation uh, and then and also uh, industry. And finally, our focus is, of course, number one on safety, but it's oh, also yeah. on cost reduction, it's reliability, and for you, it's customer satisfaction. Thank you. Back to you, Mona. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you so much. Uh, can we have uh, Graham, you want to go uh, next and uh, say a little bit of background of, of your, uh, yourself, your company? That'd be great. So the audience has context. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks everybody for attending the webinar. My name is Graham Cooley. I'm the CEO of ITM Power. I've been the CEO now for about 12 years. I have a background in the power industry. So I was business development manager at National Power, which was the UK's largest power generator, and then International Power, and a particular emphasis on energy storage. Uh, so we built the uh, world's largest electrochemical energy store. We uh, opened it in 1999. So that's more than 20 years ago now. It was 100 megawatt hours at Little Barford. It was actually a flow cell. So background in fuel cells, flow cells, supercapacitors and batteries, uh, probably a 35 year journey for me. Um, so ITM Power, uh, first Monday of 2021, we moved into the world's largest electrolyzer factory with a capacity of one gigawatt per annum. Uh, that's a thousand megawatts per annum. We, make, we manufacture PEM electrolyzers um, we have a backlog of 124 million projects uh, with our partner, Linda Engineering. Um, over the last 12 months, we bid 435 million pounds worth of capital equipment. Um, a, a, a very good measure of the excitement and the development of the green hydrogen industry. Um, in October, we raised 170 million on the London stock market, we're stock market listed. In fact, we ITM was the first hydrogen and fuel cell related company on the London stock market. And, and of that 170 million of fundraise, we were two and a half times oversubscribed and actually had an incredible response from the capital markets. So, and, and, and I would say that the capital markets are now incredibly well informed about green hydrogen and about the um, hydrogen industry. And then finally, um, we are, as Oliver said, delivering a uh, 10 megawatt electrolyzer in the Rhineland refinery with Shell, a project we're very proud of. When that was announced, that was the world's largest PEM electrolyzer. Actually, two weeks ago, we announced the sale to Linda of a 24 megawatt PEM electrolyzer, which is the new world's largest. And I'm sure that as hydrogen develops, we will constantly leapfrog what is the largest and the biggest and so on uh, as we go through. It's an incredibly rapidly developing industry. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Now I would uh, love to go to Uti. Can you tell us, uh, give us your background and uh, uh, so, and, and to put everything in context and then we'll dive into the questions. So good morning and good evening and good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> My name is Oti Ervasti. I'm, I'm vice president of renewable hydrogen and BTX platform at Neste. My background is in consulting, management consulting. I've been working uh, mainly for pulp and paper, chemicals and energy industries focusing on investment strategies, M&A, et cetera, for 30 years. I've been working in 30 countries over, and, and in almost every continent, but not in Antarctica. So, so <laughs> good to meet you all. And, good, because it's uh, melting. <laughs> and my, I'm, I'm an economist and MBA as a background, so I'm, I'm not an engineer, so I may not be able to answer to the most technical questions. But uh, when it comes to this hydrogen, 
uh, and, and PTX, it's not only the technology, it's also finding the business cases, sustainability solutions, etc. And then some words about Neste. Neste is uh, maybe not everybody knows about Neste. Uh, we are, our headquarters is in Finland, but we have refineries in Rotterdam and in Singapore, in addition to the Finnish ones. And our purpose is that we want to create a healthier planet for our children. So we create solutions for climate change, combating and accelerating a shift to circular economy. So we are refining waste, residues and innovative raw materials into renewable fuels and, and sustainable field, feedstock for plastics and other materials. So uh, we used to be an oil refiner. We, we, when we were established 60 years ago, we brought in a bad quality, a low quality crude from Russia. Now we are working on, on waste and, and, and uh, uh, this kind of low quality feedstocks. Uh, to produce renewable fuels. So we are the world's uh, leading producer of renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuels. And we have a new project in Singapore where we will add uh, very much new aviation fuel capacity. And, and uh, then we have already the goal to be carbon neutral by 2035. And also the Finnish state has, by the way, a goal to become carbon neutral by 2035. So this puts a little bit pressure on us. We have to do a lot of things. It's not only words, it's, it's a lot of things going on at the moment. And then the other issue, what we have committed us for, is that we would uh, help our customers with our products to the, uh, reduce their CO2 emissions annually by 20 million uh, tons by 2030. So uh, the, we have been recognized also as one of the most sustainable companies in the world. And then when it comes to hydrogen, so we of course as Shell, so we are, we are producing hydrocarbons. So, so hydrogen is part of, essential part of our operations. And now the question is that when we have this target of becoming carbon neutral, so we have to do something about the hydrogen that we have. Uh, we uh, have, we use the, we make the hydrogen out of natural gas as everybody else does, and it's called gray hydrogen. So now we, and, and gray hydrogen production means that there is a lot of CO2 emissions connected to it. So mm -hmm. we, we have to get rid of those emissions. So mm -hmm. then we either have to store the CO2 and, 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 and first capture and then store it, or then we make green electricity. So it means that we split water to oxygen and hydrogen with those electrolyzers that, for example, Graham is talking about. So these are the choices that we have now, and we are working on these. We also bought the stake in Sunfire, which is a German uh, electrolyzer technology company. And, and they have both alkaline and, and so-called soy electrolysis technology. So, so we are also having a pilot with them uh, in our Rotterdam refinery, testing and, and developing their soy technology. So, so we are really committed to hydrogen and we want the gray become blue or green. <laughs> I love it, that's great. So uh, now what I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, I want to put a message out to all our audience members. We're getting a ton of questions, but what I'd like to do first is I have, uh, you know, a few questions that I'd like to ask our panelists that I'm sure many of these questions that, that we're getting, that I'm getting now, will be answered. So, uh, but... Uh, to the extent that you have questions that you want to ask, continue, you know, writing in the chat box. And uh, when I see that it's relevant, we'll, we will um, uh, uh, talk to the uh, particular person or company. So, uh, so continue on with the questions, but I, wanna, I want you all to know, give us a chance to talk. There's so many questions, it's crazy. So it's good, it's all good. It's a reflection of our panel. So, okay, so my first question 
And I think this will answer a lot of, of questions that we're getting uh, now from the audience is um, I want each of you to describe very like succinctly, so we could we have a lot to cover today, what your company is doing uh, very specifically in, uh, in the hydrogen space. Like, um, and you, some of you kind of touched it a little bit, but uh, talk about what like you're doing, like Shell, for example, what you're doing, the technologies that you're using, that you're uh, uh, that you're uh, pushing out there, and uh, let's let's just talk about if, what you're doing, the projects, the technology. So I'd like to start with Oliver. Yes, and let me try to do it succinctly because I, I covered some of it in my intro. So you remember right. I mentioned yes. um, hydrogen Thank for you. transportation and hydrogen for industry. And so I, I'll leave actually that space of large electrolyzers to Graham because I know he, he, he can talk uh, about that quite okay. extensively. The bit of transportation I want to talk about, um, and I mentioned, you know, Shell's got a, a, a lot now of hydrogen refueling stations, both that you can see right now, but also in the pipeline that we will build um, shortly. So but of course, really important is the affordability of hydrogen to right. the customer. And so when you look at customers who drive cars or trucks or buses, they, they have certain needs. And um, what we are doing and what we have done is to substantially reduce the cost of the equipment. And the way we have gone about doing that is by getting scale. So in increasing the order book of the numbers of stations of equipment, dispensers, compressors, all these bits and pieces, these components, um, by increasing that scale dramatically, we've been able to, to reduce cost. But alongside that is standardizing. And so it's really important to standardize, not just say in, in one project, not even in one country, but actually across continents here. Because when you do that, then you can access the you know, global supply chains. Um, and that kind of slightly cook cut, cut, cookie cutter approach is actually very, very helpful. The other thing is we've had to take quite a lot of um, uh, proactive moves to help actually drive that forward in the industry. Shell doesn't typically make a lot of products. We provide energy, but we've had to do that because actually the supply chain is still quite immature. There's still a lot of relatively small companies, albeit they're growing rapidly, which is great. Um, but so we've taken a lot of attention on that and to address those things that I mentioned, which was safety, reliability, the cost effectiveness, and then ultimately that the customer gets what they really want, which is usually great service at an affordable, at an affordable cost. And so again, just to repeat, we're focused on refueling cars, buses, trucks, trains, ferries and ships. I didn't mention that we're also working quite extensively in the background on things like liquid hygiene. We can have a debate over gaseous and liquid hygiene. That's another topic. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the, you know, the whole industry piece, which I, I'll actually leave that to Graham, although I can talk a, a long time, but I, I think that would be probably our pause there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Oliver. So, Graham, you seem to be the natural uh, uh, follow, follow up with Oliver. Okay, so I mean, at ITM, we're interested in three markets. We're interested in industrial hydrogen, um, uh, injecting hydrogen into the gas grid and also transport. So first of all, on industrial hydrogen, um, as Uti said, um, uh, a key market is the replacement market for a grey hydrogen being replaced by green hydrogen. Actually, that's um, the entry market for large scale uh, hydrogen production, simply because it, um, it is a market that has massive demand for hydrogen already. So um, in, the, in Europe alone, we use 400 terawatt hours energy equivalent uh, um, it, of gray hydrogen for industry. Largest market is ammonia, then refineries, then methanol production, and then metals treatment. So you've got four markets there with very high demand. So 
Um, the first of those markets is the refinery market. And, and the reason for that is that green hydrogen at refineries is included in the renewable energy directive. So all refineries in Europe have to make 14% of their product renewably over the next decade. And so you see a great interest in green hydrogen at refineries. So we're building um, a, a, an electrolyzer at the Rhineland refinery, which is a very important reference project for us and actually a headline um, lighthouse project for the EU as well. Um, and that electrolyzer not only is supplying green hydrogen to the refinery, but it's also grid balancing and load balancing. So it's a fantastic and important uh, project. We also work um, in the UK in Humberside. We are doing a feed study for a 100 megawatt electrolyzer to connect directly to Hornsey. It's going to be connected directly to Hornsey 2, which is a 1.4 gigawatt offshore wind farm. It's the world's largest um, offshore wind farm. And putting the green hydrogen directly into the um, uh, uh, Philips 66 refinery, which is next door to the substation. So a fantastic project where you make green hydrogen on site and replace the existing grey hydrogen. And, and the reason that, that's, uh, that these green hydrogen projects are important is that you can deploy green hydrogen now. So um, blue hydrogen projects, um, at the timescales for them is the late 2020s, whereas you can deploy 100 megawatts in the, uh, in the time scale of 2022 to 2023. So it's uh, early decarbonisation. Um, in power to gas energy storage, we, we just um, uh, got a strategic investment and partnership from SNAM. And SNAM are um, Europe's uh, uh, largest and, and the world's second largest gas transmission company. And they're very interested in uh, replacing the natural, ga uh, natural gas in the gas grid with green hydrogen. We also work in the UK with Caden and Northern Gas Networks on putting 20% hydrogen into the UK gas network. Um, and we did the two early power to gas projects in Germany with the Tuga Group and with RWE. And then finally, transport. We, in our funding round, we raised 30 million for our subsidiary company, um, ITM Motive, which is going to be building refueling stations in the UK, buses, trucks and trains are, are our emphasis. So our emphasis is, is on those heavy vehicles that always go back to the same place to refuel so that you can have a bankable project where you have a back-to-back -back agreement between an electricity contract and also a long-term fuel contract. So three sectors for us, the early entry market, refineries and industrial hydrogen, power to gas energy storage, and also transport. I liked, Graham, that you use the word bankable. I think that uh, in my world where I'm putting these hydrogen deals together, that is what is key, is making sure yeah. that your project is bankable and uh, maybe we'll we'll get into that a little more but I'd like to uh, shift to hear uh, all about um, uh, Nesty with Uti please if you could tell us what um, you did say a little bit but if you could um, elaborate that would be great. Yes uh, we, we are now uh, focusing on this uh, green or blue hydrogen, as I told already, because we want to be carbon neutral. Then we want to also help our customers carbon footprint and, and also come with products with like lower carbon intensity. And it also means uh, kind of better products for us uh, price-wise. Uh, uh, we started with this kind of um, uh, technology pr producer acquisition, or, or with, uh, as I told already, we bought a, a stake in Sunfire, and we started our kind of uh, green hydrogen journey with the kind of EU project. It's called Multify, and it's a, a 2.6 uh, megawatt project in our Rotterdam refinery. 
Here we are testing a little bit different technology as it is SOEC technology, and it has a future promise for uh, power, uh, uh, power to liquids in, in, in a refinery context it, because it's uh, considered uh, to be then a more energy efficient way uh, of producing synthetic fuels in the future. But that is something that we do together with NG, Sunfire and CEA uh, and uh, Paul Wirt. So that's a, a, a partially EU financed project. Then uh, we are in Porvo, that is, uh, we have a site in, in Finland, which is a big one. And here we are focusing on, on first uh, on blue hydrogen. We are focusing on the hydrogen production unit and we are capturing the CO2 from there. And then we are now, now planning the, the way how we store it and, and, and transport it and, and store it. The other thing that we are doing there is this uh, green uh, hydrogen project. And actually we are planning a 50 megawatt project in, in, in Finland, in Porvo. And, and we filed as anybody, everybody else did the innovation fund application for that. So the EU, the European Union has, uh, uh, has uh, kind of announced a kind of uh, funding scheme for, for this kind of green transition. And, and they are also allocating money for this kind of purposes. And, and a lot of companies are, are, are seeking for this kind of uh, support for these, these projects. As you thought already about the bankability, that's of course an issue here. Yes. <laughs> quite many of the projects uh, depend, uh, are, are subject to this kind of financing and, and support from the EU. Uh, but anyway, we, what we see also there that we are then able to, when we have the green hydrogen, and then we will capture the CO2. So then that gives us a crown to make synthetic fuels, which are totally detached from biomass use. And, and uh, so they are using the water, renewable electricity and, and captured CO2 as feedstock. And, and that is one of the kind of future promises for, for this kind of fuel. We, we aim at uh, producing this for the aviation sector, mm -hmm. also for road transportation. So, so that's something that we have on our mind. And also then when we capture the CO2, so we also look at other ways for CO2 utilization. Could we store the CO2 and, 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 and sequestrate it in the materials for more durable use than fuels? So that's also something that we increasingly pay attention to. And we also call the other companies to collaborate on this. What can we do with the CO2 captured? How can we add value, make value out of that? So, so interesting things are going on. And I think that when, when you talked about the bankable things, we also think yeah. of that uh, European goal of becoming carbon neutral and, and, and really drastically decreasing the emissions from the industry. And then this is not only a private project of the companies, it's also like a general European project. And, mm -hmm. and, and it has, it, it, it's a little bit different kind of things. It's, it's also, there's a lot of collaboration between the companies and, and also the EU, which is involved in this development. Well, uh, thank you very much for, again, um, uh, talking about the bankability, because I think uh, the cost and safety, these are some, and, and scaling hydrogen in order to make it, uh, you know, to become, uh, 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 to proliferate, uh, you know, is, 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 is really important. Um, and to become exponential, it's critical that we have, um, you know, the, the cost drivers for hydrogen, you know, come down, that the uh, projects that we embark on are bankable from the beginning. Uh, and that's how you scale. You brought up uh, a very good point uh, that I'd like uh, uh, you to talk about, just elaborate a little bit more, Uti, about the, um, in Europe, which is really driving you know, the growth of application of, of hydrogen to end users. There's, if you could just touch on uh, just a few, you, you started to in your, uh, what, you, what you just spoke about, 
some of the uh, maybe government policies in the EU. Uh, and I could say a little bit about what's going on in the, in the United States, but um, perhaps if you could, you, you touched on that, maybe elaborate a little bit more on that. And then I'll, uh, that, I think the audience would be happy to hear that from you. Yes, uh, I would definitely want to. Uh, there is now, uh, I, we have the COVID going on as everybody else. Right. So, so now we, there is a kind of um, uh, remedy packages and, and uh, uh, recovery packages uh, being formed. And, and part of this is also to kind of make a giant leap in, in, in this kind of transition to, to a green economy. Uh, the European Union has also last year uh, adopted a kind of a target that is fit for 55. It's not your age, but it's about cutting the greenhouse gas emissions by 55% from the 1990 level until 2030. And this is quite an ambitious target. And, and then hydrogen has been considered as one of the key ingredients in this kind of goals. And, and as we already discussed about this industrial uses, for example, that's one part. And then the thing is also to, to uh, increase its use in the energy and, and make infrastructural kind of improvements to promote the hydrogen economy. Hydrogen is now about, uh, 2% uh, of the European energy mix, uh, but the goal is to increase that to seven to tenfold until 2050. And then the investments related to that, uh, they, they say it can be 500 billion, it can be more, depends on the, on the kind of, uh, uh, the guesstimates that are given on this thing. Uh, then uh, how will this be done? Uh, there are these goals, and now the European Commission has already in also invited the companies to work on that. So there is an alliance for, for green hydrogen, and, and there are round tables uh, for, uh, consisting of industry representatives and also NGOs talking about how can we do this. And, and, and uh, so, so each, each of these table are focusing on specific subjects. We are sitting in the table for uh, industrial applications. So we have to list, make a list of projects, what are, what's, what's going to happen and, and how can we work together and what are the obstacles for this and mm -hmm. how can we uh, overcome the obstacles. So, so this is not only companies, it's also the political, strong political will to, to, to make a breakthrough, also make a paradigm shift in, in how we are dealing with energy and, and hydrogen right. plays a big role there. Thank you, thank you. That's a very good answer. I want to just touch a little bit about uh, the United States. We are not as evolved as the uh, Europeans and, the, <laughs> and in the Asian markets, uh, but we, uh, we do have programs available with the Department of Energy. We have uh, loan programs, grants. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, one thing I've been working with is people in the, the new uh, Biden administration, uh, and we're helping them along with um, other stakeholders in Washington to help uh, proliferate the application of hydrogen for end users, uh, primarily in the United States and for American companies. Which brings me to a question that I want to ask you all, uh, which is, you know, as we know, hydrogen is expected to play a very big role in very, in very different applications, like we've talked about today. Um, upstream oil and gas, uh, electricity generation, uh, natural gas for heating, uh, fossil fuel, you know, for replacement, for transport, whether that's EVs or trucks or fleets or shipping or aviation. Um, and they have all these different lines, these vertical lines of business have developed differently and independently. There's like right now, I could tell you, because I've worked on so many, there's, we're going through a SPAC craze right now 
here in the United States and with involving hydrogen primarily in the transportation sector, um, transportation and, and aviation. Um, do you believe that we should have um, greater coordination and collaboration among the different companies and stakeholders to achieve the best outcome to uh, make sure to have, uh, to scale, to go to scale quicker and to drive the cost down. Uh, Oliver, do you have any thoughts on, on, that, on that? The Hydrogen Council, you may not be aware of it, but the Hydrogen Council actually brings together many many companies, some of the top right. companies of the oh, yeah. world. Right. And Absolutely. that is very much uh, focused on what you're talking about. Uh, right. We have to be careful about when we talk about coordination, right. of course. So I do want to get that out there. So, I want to talk more about your company, yeah. <laughs> in, uh, absolutely. So, okay. so, so, so what I would encourage people to do is Google yeah. or type in Hydrogen Council, I think it's .com or whatever, but you will see the, the participants yeah. in that uh, and the kinds of advocacy that is being you know, requested and the kinds of uh, activities. But I do want to pick you up, um, Mona, on the US because I don't think yeah. the US is behind at all. In fact, Shell is very, very active in California um, and California is extremely active. We and call I would California the hydrogen highway, by the way. That's what we call it. Yes. And, you know, they have been at it for decades, yes. um, as yes. Shell has. I didn't say yes. that in my intro, but, but we have been yes. at it for decades. Right. Um, but what I wanted to say was that some of the policies that California has introduced, the low carbon fuel standard, have been right. terrific, really Absolutely. good. And the yes. reason why that's so good is because it has helped get past the chicken and egg problem. What we as an infrastructure provider have to try to do is to marry the infrastructure, build the infrastructure before vehicles show up. Otherwise, you know, no one's going to buy a vehicle, right, if they can't fill up. So, so how do you kind of get past this sort of sequencing step and how do you marry these things up? And the LCFS does that because right. it, basically, it basically rewards you for bringing capacity online ahead of the demand. And so you know, in form of credits and you can monetize those. So that is a fantastic piece of work done by, uh, you know, Mary Nichols and her team over, yes. in, over in California. Yes. And I do think that's an example. And what I start to see, and I know some of the questions come in about Canada and other uh, nearby states also start to look quite carefully at that. I think it's a very good model. Uh, in Europe, actually, we start to hear noises around things like more public-private partnerships with governments, there's, there's a lot of push in the European Union for things like innovation funding. That is so very much required as we come down this cost curve. It's not the case that we need to be on a subsidy forever. No, but we do need to share the burden of that investment down the cost curve. And then once we're down the cost curve, then in a way we're good to go, so to speak, and investors will see the business opportunity without subsidies and get a, an appropriate return. And we're on that cost curve. We're not down yet. In some use cases like light duty, I can see line of sight mid 2020s where we are in California, actually without needing subsidies to, to justify new stations coming on. And that's the combination of scale and cost reduction and all these other initiatives. Europe may be a little, little further to go. Uh, and of course, when you move into some of those other use cases, Mona, you mentioned, Yes. They actually become progressively harder. They are progressively less affordable. Transportation is sort of right at the top of affordability. And as we go down and down and down, all the way through you know, things like refining and then down to fertilizers. I mean, how many farmers are going to put an extra cent on what they produce? Right. This is where the challenges come and where you have to think about things like, you know, price on carbon and things like that. Right. So I'll stop there. Right. Thank you, Oliver. That was very comprehensive. Um, I'll just say as the deal lawyer that's putting together these hydrogen deals, one thing, as you all know, is uh, that, that it, we should let our audience members know too, is that it is all about collaboration. It is all about partnerships. I can't tell you, well, you all know, but I can't tell you how many partnerships, strategic partnerships 
we are seeing uh, that we're putting together to really make uh, the deals bankable, you know? So uh, it's, it's uh, and then we are taking these bankable deals to apply to different applications using hydrogen. You know, we talked about today, um, we talked about fuel, we talked a little bit about battery technology. Um, another one that I'm really excited about is steel. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on, on green steel and or maybe uh, applications more in the industrial sector, maybe Graham. Uh, I think this is up your, <laughs> up your alley. Yes. So, so yeah, so um, first of all, I'd like to respond to what you said about Europe. So yes. um, okay. the, the European recovery deal is a trillion euros. Um, yeah. Actually, 15% of that is for green hydrogen. So there's 150 billion over the next decade. It's 10, 100 billion of that. So 10 billion a year for 10 years is for contracts for different options. So those options are um, to incentivize the gap between green hydrogen and gray hydrogen. What, one thing we haven't touched upon is the cost structure of green hydrogen. Because yes. actually the cost structure of green hydrogen is dominated by the cost of renewable power. And, and actually the, um, the renewable power tends to be regional in its cost structure. And the technique that you use tends to be regional as well. So actually the thing that the EU have put in place that is different from anywhere else in the world is that they have a strategy for developing a business model. And if you don't have a revenue model for hydrogen, then you can't achieve a project which can get to financial close. And, and the, the trigger for all of those European projects where you've seen all of the press releases about groupings and so on, are the CFDs, which are coming out at the end of this year. So the, the first country actually to announce a CFD for hydrogen was the German government, actually right. followed on the 8th of July by the European package. And there's a CFD for green hydrogen being designed in the UK as well. So you will know when there's a transition to green hydrogen in the US, when there's a hydrogen strategy that defines a business model. And uh, until then, there'll be one market and that market's transport. And the reason it's transport is because the high value of hydrogen in transport means that if you have a heavy vehicle that always comes back to the same place to refuel, it's the only bankable example of a hydrogen project until we have CFDs, because industrial hydrogen has a lower price point and the gas grid has a lower price point than replacing petrol and diesel. So that's what I'd say about the, the, uh, the business models. Um, in, in terms of uh, industrial hydrogen and steel, steel is very, very interesting. You can start decarbonizing steel straight away because a lot of the hydrogen in steel is actually used for metals treatment. So there's a very large underlying uh, uh, demand for metals treatment without a technology change. Steel making also uses oxygen. So you've got both uh, an addition to oxy fuel from the oxygen made in an electrolyzer and the blanket gas you need for annealing. So it's a great entry market for hydrogen, but the, the big prize in steel making is to replace the primary reductant, which is coke. As you know, right. steel is made by mixing coke with iron ore, and the, the coke produces CO2 and removes the oxygen from the iron. You could do that with hydrogen. It's called direct reduction iron, or the DRI process. And there are many steel companies around the world now looking at completely decarbonizing steel using right. green hydrogen. So right. a very interesting um, application. But I, I say again, if, if the CFDs aren't in place and the incentives for hydrogen aren't in place, we won't get to a green hydrogen economy. And, and it's imperative because green hydrogen is the only net zero energy gas. There isn't yeah. another one. 
Blue hydrogen isn't net zero. Any other form of hydrogen is not zero. It's only green hydrogen. And the incentives need to be in place so that the business models work. So um, I want to stay with you, Graham, for a moment. Um, I'm uh, working on some projects in the, in the US with pipelines. And we're uh, converting some existing pipelines for uh, and blending with hydrogen. Uh, tell us, Graham, your uh, views and what are the issues for um, hydrogen permeability in pipelines and then ultimately with end use appliances? Like, do you, how is that, do you think that is being addressed? Will it be um, addressed? Uh, specifically, how is this? How can we, as an end user, right, as a, con a consumer, use the hydrogen in these pipelines for, uh, no. uh, yes, can you, can you uh, okay. uh, enlighten us, Graham? Sure. So, so look, um, the gas infrastructure players all over the world are looking at yeah. sleeving their pipes. But the reason they're sleeving their pipes is because gas grids, you will never get to net zero if gas grids leak. And so gas grids all over the world now, particularly in Europe, are being sleeved. And actually the project is to sleeve those, the gas network, not only so that you prevent methane leakage, but also they're, they're being retrofit um, as hydrogen compliant as well. And, and you'll know that if a gas grid leaks, uh, methane is 80 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than, than um, CO2. So that's the first thing. Our gas grid in the UK, many gas grids around the world, used to be 60% hydrogen prior to 1969. So we ran a 60% hydrogen gas grid in the UK um, ever since the uh, um, gas grid was first installed. Today, you can put 20% hydrogen in the gas grid and you don't need to change end user devices. So the flame speed of a mix of methane and hydrogen is the same up to 20%. And turbines on the gas network are in warranty up to 20%. Okay, And that's because the flame speed uh, um, is very, very similar. So we work on on projects with Caden and Northern Gas Networks, and we did projects with RWE, putting 20% hydrogen. And today in the UK, in Kiel, we are injecting 20% hydrogen into the gas grid. I mean, literally today. And they are the end users are using that hydrogen without knowing that it's decarbonized hydrogen. So um, if you want to go above 20%, you need to change the end user devices in people's houses. And you have Worcester Bosch and Baxi now designing um, uh, um, compliant hydrogen ready boilers. And, and many of them producing uh, um, hobs as well. The way that you increase the percentage of hydrogen in, into gas injection is you go into a pipe which goes directly to an application like for instance, district heating. In which case, all you need to do is change the burner and you can increase the amount of hydrogen. It is an accessible demand where you can um, uh, do admixtures uh, almost immediately. So you've got a number of different thresholds, but the, I think the, the key thing here is that when you look at the UK and the rest of Europe, more than 80% in every European country of domestic dwellings are connected to the gas grid. So actually by decarbonizing the gas grid, you decarbonize all of those dwellings in one go. And you can centralize where you inject the hydrogen. So you have a ready-made infrastructure with sunk capital. And, and the key thing to do is utilize that existing infrastructure. Thank you. That's very, very thorough. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Graham. I have another question. I'm going to go to Oliver with this one because I think this needs to be addressed. This is kind of the elephant in the room, as we say. Uh, 
I want to discuss um, storage and transportation of hydrogen and um, end user costs. Uh, how they are, you know, to use hydrogen, you know, these, the storage and transportation costs are, um, how are you dealing with it to, to bring the cost uh, down so that uh, you can scale? It's a very good question. Uh, I <laughs> focused most of my team uh, a few years ago on the equipment on forecourts. So okay. how do we you know, simply reduce the cost of dispensing equipment and tanks on the forecourt. Just think of a regular, your regular gasoline station doing, trying to do the equivalent for hydrogen. And, you know, done a lot of progress, half the cost and quadruple to throughput for the same space. And, and we, you know, it's a bit like solar panels and you're going down and down the cost curve and the performance is increasing all the time. The question though, of course, is there's another bunch of costs. So that's one part. And the, there's another stack of costs, one of which we sort of touched on which is how we produce the hydrogen so let's say electrolysis well most of that cost is actually related to the power price i mean there's a little obviously there's the capital cost but the large when you start to run that thing it's very very much determined by the power price so okay you choose a good location you're set now we have the bit in between which is how do we get the hydrogen from where it's produced to electrolyze in that right. example to where the stations are, which could be many stations around there and could be for trucks or buses or for cars or what have you. And there we have options, don't we? We talked about pipelines, Graham just talked about pipelines. Right. <laughs> Actually, Shell has a station on a pipeline in Torrance in the sort of near Los Angeles area. I have to say it is, it's a 100% it's a dedicated, uh, it's a hydrogen pipeline, 100% hydrogen. This is a very, very, very common uh, to have hydrogen moved by pipelines that's well known, done for decades. Right. Um, then you clean it up a little bit for automotive use um, and then off you go. And that is actually the most economic way uh, to do it to date, to move hydrogen from A to B. Now, of course, not everywhere is sitting on a pipeline. Right. <laughs> and so then you get into truck distribution and that's a big piece that I'm focused on at the moment and you know what we're trying to do is how do you get more hydrogen transported by truck so obviously more volume is lower unit cost and big focus on um, you know the, the tank materials to 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 effectively trans be able to transport more because the more you can do that, the better you can do that, the, the bigger your drop load to those stations. It's just, it's like a milk round. It's like a bigger mm -hmm. milk flow, you know, just delivering more milk to customers. We're trying to do, deliver more hydrogen to our stations. Uh, so that is a big uh, area. It's also, what I saw in some of the questions here, you know, what should people be, you know, if people want to invest and get into this area of hygiene, what should they look at? Is there any scope? And I'm like, yeah, there are many components and pieces of the value chain that needs attention. I mentioned like tube trailers and tanks and stuff, but it's not only that, it's things like heavy duty compressors. No one has yet built a heavy duty high flow compressor because it's quite difficult and so on and so forth. There's valves, there's bits and pieces. If you look carefully at all the individual steps, there's, there are lots of pieces that individually, we all as actors in this whole thing, we need to bring them all down so that it becomes affordable to the customer. And for that, Shao is uh, you know, working with partners and continue to be interested to see technologies. Right, right, you guys are. Um, I wanna, Oti, can I talk, to, can you tell us a few uh, if Nesty has a different philosophy than Shell, or are you doing what you can to, uh, you know, how, what are you, what is the, to, to drive the costs down in particular with storage and transport? Well, we are producing the hydrogen either on the site or then our, some of the refineries uh, utilize the hydrogen from the pipeline. So we are, of course, right. uh, interested in the pipeline development. That's, uh, and, and, and also when we think of this, again, the European situation, there is certainly a need to, to kind of strengthen the pipelines also do see what we can do to the former natural gas pipelines. Can we do some kind of, what, what adjustments do we need to do there? Graham already talked about this, 
then uh, if we we have this experience from the integration of the green hydrogen to refinery, then we also can see that uh, we have to learn about the integration costs. It's, it's all expensive and, and uh, th this is something that we, we all have to do uh, and, and uh, to, to, to see this, the kind of storage and integration cost, the, the infrastructure for the, for the hydrogen transportation. How do we do it? And, and again, European Union comes with the projects of common interest. So there right. is a possibility right. to kind of uh, do the infrastructure projects which involve participants from different countries to, to, to work together on how we can solve the kind of problems together. Uh, then what I also uh -huh. wanted to say here is about the, uh, another cost component that already was addressed, and this is the renewable electricity. And, and, and we are really uh, kind of very excited to hear about what will be the legislation uh, finally concerning that. So, so what is counted as, as acceptable for, for green hydrogen? And here we, of course, hope that the, the, the legislation would be straightforward and, and not too complicated to apply, because mm -hmm. otherwise it will increase tremendously to the costs or give some parties enough uh, too much sort of competitive advantage. So it should be fair and, and easy to easy to implement with the additionality principles and what have you there. But still we would like to call for for kind of simple legislation so that it wouldn't be an obstacle for developing this branch. So we are, uh, we are, thank you so much. That was very helpful. And we are, uh, we're, we're uh, rounding out. We only have a few minutes left. So I wanted to uh, just ask some questions um, and also address them here because I've, there's a lot of questions we're getting from our audience. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, you know, we talked a lot about today driving uh, the cost down and scaling, and uh, not only scaling, but becoming exponential in, in, our, in our particular segments. So there are numerous opportunities available uh, for hydrogen uh, production, hydrogen application for end users, and there are uh, many applications also, uh, or opportunities, I should say, for uh, in uh, for for infrastructure funds, for pipeline developers, uh, uh, and uh, for um, other end users in these different sectors, whether they're in um, transportation or fuel supply or batteries, etc. There's there's a, a tremendous uh, loss of opportunities uh, here. Um, I wanted to, uh, we're getting a lot of questions about uh, what the recent events that happened in Texas and Germany. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to just open it up because I've got so many questions about that, whether uh, any of you have a comment that you would like to um, say quickly um, um, hydrogen's role <laughs> with respect to the failures that we just saw um, in Germany and, and Texas with the with the uh, fuel supply for the power. Yeah, I mean the origins of those events are different, but um, you know, in Texas, if you're looking at uh, extremely cold weather, uh, then uh, conventional generation equipment is likely to go down. I think what you're saying is, is there an energy storage solution uh, to the problem? Uh, I think that um, uh, if you're looking at hydrogen for energy storage, the, the, um, and, and you look at all the different energy storage technologies, actually hydrogen is the lowest cost, longest duration energy storage technique. By far the lowest cost if you're above a few hours. And, and as you go into days, months, and years, it becomes lower and lower cost, of course, because with hydrogen, you separate power from energy, which you don't do with, with batteries, for instance. So, um, but, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought the 
Texas event was fascinating because of the amount of, of, of disinformation or fake news there was out there about <laughs> turbines, wind, wind turbines freezing and uh, photographs from 2012 of a winter, but frozen winter by net wasn't even in Texas. I mean, it was. Uh, <laughs> It actually was amazing, <laughs> really. So uh, nothing more to say than that, really. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we are, um, I, I wanted to, uh, uh, I see Luke. I want to uh, just, uh, so we're, we've come to the end. Uh, Luke, I'll, I'll hand it over to you unless we have, uh, we can maybe go around one more time for last thoughts from our, panelists, if that's okay with you, or we'll just okay. save it for the next webinar that we're going to be doing. Go for it. We can uh, have one minute of uh, last uh, thoughts and summaries, as long as no one's got uh, meetings to shoot to. Does anyone want to say, any of my panelists, anyone want to say last words? Well, just to say that it's, it's been fantastic to have all of you with us. Um, I, I'm dead chuffed, as I said in the beginning, to see uh, 1600 of you or more uh, on this on this webinar and I I've been furiously trying to answer some of your questions but I'm losing the battle uh, so I'm not sure whether we are able to do that uh, offline Luke but anyhow uh, all the best uh, and thank you for your interest in hydrogen we'll, we'll speak again yes uh, did you want to say anything with you before we leave well yeah very you similar you. Thank oh. sorry you carry on <laughs> So thank you, everybody. It has been a pleasure. And, and uh, let's work together to kind of uh, make the healthier planet for our children and also have a prosperous future together with hydrogen. So thank you on my behalf and, and wish you a very healthy spring, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I want to say, bye -bye. yeah, thank you to everyone, all our audience. We realized that we only had an hour we have a lot more to get into. There's a lot more detail that we can get into. Uh, feel free uh, if anyone wants to uh, contact any of us uh, for your specific questions. I know I'll be open to that. Um, you know, and we want to also thank Reuters Events and Luke Brett. Thank you for the opportunity to spread the word and the gospel of hydrogen. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you for the audience. Um, I mentioned previously that we'll have the recordings ready within a week. So we'll get those out to you. Uh, of course, big thank you to our panelists and stay tuned to what we're doing in hydrogen. Um, so, there's so much buzz. So let's keep the momentum going. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.